Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault podcast. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode I have a listener request and this is from my good friend and listener Dan Bone who himself is a fellow podcaster. He's from the podcast on Haunted Hill and he also uh, very regularly guests with me on my other show which is Bite Size Cinema. But um, he said that could you take a look at the strange case of the cotton leaf fairies and I figure that most of you guys would have would be familiar with this case it's the uh, little girl at the bottom of her garden who's taking pictures of fairies and it's a it's an actually it's a very beautiful picture uh, in black and white of this girl um, with fairies and it's in all the mystery books I grew up with it. Um, as I said in the last episode, you remember I said about the uh, PG tip um, tea bag um, cards. It was on there. It was in all the uh, coffee book um, table books. And um, as it turns out, it is actually a hoax. Um, but I'm going to get into that a little bit more detail later on. But the other thing I I've done with this before I'm going to get into the actual Cottonly uh, fairy case itself is I've taken a look at fairies in general because I like to be, be able to bring um, a little bit of the history and what fairies is all about and to be honest with you I'm possibly going to be the same as everybody else um, I'm sure some of you probably know a little bit more about it than, than I do but when I think of fairies I think of let's face it Disney you know you've got the um, fairy godmother from Cinderella and you've got like Tinkerbell from uh, Peter Pan so that is probably my first the first image that comes to my head is of a um, a very small being with wings a, usually like a, a lady a very pretty lady with wings and She'll be flying around and she'll be casting a spell and helping you out. That isn't entirely the case. The, the, now, when I looked into this, the actual fairies goes right back to the year dot. Very similar to, well, in fact, it's almost identical to the case that I just had a look at with the, the vampires in the last episode. Fairies go right back to, you know, year dot. Um, having a look at every. Um, this online it's it's very difficult to try and sort of pinpoint a time from where they come from um, but like I say having a look uh, they generally come from uh, the European location on the map um, it is old folklore towns mainly Irish Scottish English like I say uh, Germany France those areas in Europe that's kind of where these these stories originate from and they're basically like a, a, a mythical being or legendary creature found in, let's say, multiple locations in Europe. And most of the cultures that have fairies are Celtic, Slavic, German, English and France. But today, um, because of their popularity, it is spread worldwide. In, in modern day you know stories especially with as I said with 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 Disney but to, to actually say what a, what a fairy is um, they were they were commonly known back in back in the old times as as the fae or the fair or the fair folk and when I say fae it can be um, spelled as f a y or the fair f a i r or fae as in f a e and just to sort of jump straight to the chase to say, well, what are they and what's the basic building block here? So if I, if I explain it in terms of, of faith and religions and things like that, so m most of the religions out there believe in either angels and demons, just for an example. So the angels come from heaven and the demons come from hell. And, you know, heaven's accepted the angels and hell has accepted the demons. But the fae, or the fairies, are the ones in the middle. So they are the ones who aren't bad enough to go to hell, but they are not good enough to go to heaven. So they have been banished by, by both, 
and they remain on the earth. So what you have here, you have these beings that are kind of like, uh, they, they're like uh, demoted angels and demoted demons as such that are left to roam the earth. And that generates from the early days of old stories and um, what our ancestors believed in and the folklore today. So the, um, as I said earlier, the, the Fey and the Fair Folk, which is from the old language, is basically um, a way of explaining some sort of mystical creature or being. So you have the Fair Folk, which uh, for a prime example is, as, as most of us all know, Merlin the Wizard. You know, this guy with mystical powers going right back to the, um, I think it was back in the Roman times of that old tale, we believe. So here's an example of fair folk, a, be, a a mystical being that's taken a human form, but then he has these mystical powers. And then they can also be a form of spirit, often described in the metaphysical, supernatural, and the preternatural. And they often have, as I said with Merlin, magical powers. And then you have... Uh, fairies as we know today and that word was first used in the 17th century in France by a French author Madame du Olenoy I, I think I've got that right guys I'm, I'm really bad with uh, pronunciations like that but Madame de Olenoy um, she was a French author and she wrote fairy tales and the, the fairy is a French pronunciation so she, she used, so to explain this, she used the word fairy to describe a certain type of uh, mystical creature. But then you still have the fair or the fair folk, which was described this mystical creature being in a human form, such as I said, such as um, Merlin, like a sort of type of demigod. I hope that kind of makes sense, guys. So that's where I'm sort of building this up from. So then when you look at fairies um, as creatures, now this 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 is creatures that we all know about. And these are uh, myth mythical entities such as dragons, elves, giants, gnomes, goblins, griffins, mermaids, trolls, unicorns. Um, and they're, they're all creatures that we know about. And the, the actual fairies as we know today um being like the, the the Tinkerbell characters and and then the fairy godmother so you basically so it's been broken down into like two sets so this is what this is kind of what blew my mind is that there's me thinking that fairy was just a a character you know like Tinkerbell but it's not it's actually describing all of the mythical creatures in the world that we know about and then that's what leads into the um, the fairy tales that we know today. So you have the uh, the Brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen. And the Brothers Grimm from Germany, they wrote these stories. I think they wrote two to three hundred stories altogether. And this was in the 19th century in Germany. And they did the same as what they did as, as in Bram Stoker. As I explained in the last episode, they basically spent a lot of time researching old stories from old to do with the fair and the fair, fair, fair folk of these mystical creatures, and they brought them up to date with um, the books that they wrote, the, the stories, the fairy tales as we know today. But the thing with these books is they were gruesome, you know. We all know, and that's where the that's where another word that comes to mind is, you know. When something horrible happens or we see something disgusting, we always come out and say, oh, that's grim. And that, that's relating to the Grimm brothers and their books and their, you know, their, their horror stories, basically. And they've been watered down throughout the ages um, to be turned into uh, kids' stories, you know, children's stories, which are, in actual fact, very good stories. You know, I read them when I was, when I was growing up. But the actual origi origins are scary. And... This is where this, it really has, like I say, guys, it really has blown my mind. This topic, you probably hear it in my, in my voice. And for me to actually, uh, I'm really yeah, running over this because I could probably do a whole podcast <laughs> um, on this or, you know, show itself. 
um, because there's so, so many strands and avenues and go down, I'm just sort of breaking it down. But um, from there onwards, with the Grim Fairy Tales and Hans Christian Andersen, and then leading up to Disney, um, to what we know today with the stories, um, the origins of the fair is quite scary because some of these mystical creatures can be good and some of them can be bad as we know and some of them can be very sort of um, boisterous and things like that and uh, practical jokers you know such as the let's say for example the the, the hobgoblins um, you got the leprechauns and then you kind of have the the good fairies I suppose you have like the griffins and the and the mermaids and like you say the wizards and then you have like the witches I guess that, that is like an interpretation itself as well um, so the question now is are they real you know could could these could fairies exist could they be out there um, and this is quite important to to leading on to this cotton leaf fairy story because there is actually a point here I'm making and it's quite important to actually put this um, building block into this it, it, into this story to try and understand those those two girls taking photographs of the bottom of the garden um, now when I've had the, the time, the little time, the little time I've spent on this actually <laughs> um, looking at the fairies and the fae um, is first of all they're really old stories, they go back 6,000 years, uh, right back to the Bronze Age. And I always think that they didn't have any social media or books as such back then, but they told these campfire stories and somehow we've managed to... It, it's very difficult to try and get those stories because nothing was really put down onto paper, but we've managed to sort of collate that evidence either through, like I say, hieroglyphs, carvings all that sort of stuff but the fact is that they they told these stories so there was something in their in their culture in their community that made them think that there's something mystical out in the woods back in those times and they believed that you know these creatures might take the children and there's also a very old story where um going back like say six thousand years where there was a um a smith who basically exchanged his hammer to the devil for a magical hammer that was going to produce like 10 times the amount in one day but that came with a price and this is what the Grimm brothers looked at and they took those interpretations and basically you could sort of see that as like the, the Tower of Rapunzel of the king and queen sort of doing this offering so you can sort of see how that works but these are from old tales but going back to the point of you know could fairies exist? The only thing, the only way I can explain this from my from my perspective is, you know, I am I love my movies, I love all my fantasy, you know, the the Lord of the Rings uh, films like Labyrinth, The Wizard of, Wizard of Oz, um, that that is kind of like my interpretation of fairies, you know, Disney, Cinderella, stuff like that. So. As a person, I'm, I'm aware of this when someone says fairy, and. I, I go out for, for like walks, you know, you go out for family walks in, in woods and sometimes you go out like during the springtime and you sort of see all the flowers that are coming up and stuff like that. And I have myself and I'm sure, I don't know if you guys could agree with me on this, but you, you might go somewhere, there might be somewhere you go to and you actually say to yourself, wow, this is very much like a sort of, sort of fairy. It's got a real sort of mystical thing about it. And I, I generally think that from the old folklore times, I think as, as human beings, I think we generally have that sort of sense. And you can imagine that, take yourself back 6,000 years walking through those woods, did we get those same sort of senses? You know, did you feel like you was in a mystical place? And I think that is where fairies come from. It is just that mystical sense that we get when we go somewhere and there might be a place that you go to and you think this is this this feels very magical and just think in your head is there a place like that and i think that's that's where this stuff comes from whether it's real or not you could walk past some flowers and you kind of think oh did i just see something there um 
and I think that is kind of like, as humans, that's kind of like our basic sense of a little bit of fantasy and a little bit of myst- mystical. As I've mentioned in the, in the mystery world generally, we do like a bit of mystic. So just going out for a walk and thinking, you know, this this place feels magical. That's kind of like your basic block. And then going on from that, you, you then read literature like the Brothers Grimm, which some people say they pick up a book and it basically uh, takes you to another place. So it's like a type of escapism. So that's another platform that you're on. And then the other platform from that which I'm familiar with is movies and cinema. And then that can be Disney. So you could watch um, Cinderella with the fairy godmother. Or Peter Pan with uh, Tinkerbell. Or films like The Wizard of Oz or or The Labyrinth movie uh, with uh, David Bowie. Um, and when I watch those films, I've, and I heard other people say this as well, you know, you feel like you're you're in a bit of escapism. You've you've gone to another place. So if you take all of that, it it is basically your imagination firing up. And this is now now this is leading into the cotton leaf fairies for me. And I'm kind of jump I'm kind of jumping to the the end of that case. But what I think's happened here. <laughs> is that you've got two girls playing in the garden and they're funny enough playing by a, a a stream or waterfall which is where people say that you know fairies can can originate from that's where they like to be uh, places of running water and stuff like that and what's to say these two girls they've they would have been familiar with the, with the fairy books back then there would have been fairy books back in the 1920s the Grimm brothers as, as i mentioned and they're playing by the stream. They're, they're probably imagining fairies to be there, and they've got a camera and they've cut out some fairies, and that is their interpretation in their imagination at that time. That's what they're trying to sort of put onto a photo, much like a, an early Photoshop, to say, well, okay, the fairies aren't real, but they feel like they're real, and we we've developed a photo. For, for people to see what we see from a child's perspective and I think even, even though this case is a hoax and the girls eventually came out later on in life and said you know it wasn't real but what, what I do like about it is that what what's happened in this case is the, is the girls have basically taken a picture of their imagination and the feeling of the you know the fairies and the mystic is mystical um, thing of being a child at the bottom of the garden playing by a stream and thinking fairies are there. So even though it's a hoax, uh, I think what I'm trying to say here is is that what you have here is a fake photo, but a picture of a kid's imagination to what they see, which I think is fantastic in itself and that that's kind of like the point I'm getting to here is that um, I think that's fantastic in the way itself um, and the other thing to mention here as well is that it's 1917 uh, it's World War One you know millions of people around the world have been affected by this war millions of casualties and what is really the harm in two girls you know, publishing some photographs say they've seen some fairies, and I imagine in those times it probably created a little bit of escapism uh, for people. So, <laughs> the rights and wrongs of it, of them making this story up, but in the end, I'm here talking about it. And you know, look at those photos now, and I think they are really nice photographs. And um, and I think the top platform from this building block to where the point I'm getting to here now is it's just escapism and it's a bit of fun. So I've kind of jumped to the end there guys um, <laughs> without actually telling you a little bit telling you about the Cottonley case as such but um, I, I felt like I needed to explain that in order for me to try and I- explain this story itself and what I think of. So let's, let's turn back the clock again um, and let's talk about the Cottonley fairies and give you some give you a rundown on that. So, um, Cottonley is a, a place in Yorkshire in England. It was 1917, and as I said, it was World War One. And the 
two girls, uh, Elsie Wright, who was 16 years, and Frances Griffin, or Griffiths, nine years, um, took these controversial photos of these um, fairies behind the, the house that they lived in. Um, there's a st- small stream behind the house, again, very mystical looking place, I imagine, for, from that age. And um, the parents were telling them not to play down there, but every time the kids came back, they said, we like playing down there because we see the fairies. And Elsie's father was a photographer. He had his own dark room. And Elsie was also very artistic as well, so she's very clever. She knew how to use a camera. And they decided to take a picture of these fairies, and in total they, t- they took five uh, photos all together with this camera. And I think this camera was like a, you basically had a, a, a single picture, and you opened up the lens, and then you could only like take one photograph at a time. So they took the first photo, it got developed, and it's a picture of Elsie with a garden gnome. And the funny thing is, it's a, it, they said fairies, but they said gnome. This goes back to me saying earlier that the interpretation of a fairy can be several different things. In this case, they're saying it's a garden gnome. Great photo when you look at it. Check it out online. Um, Elsie's father treated the pictures as a joke. He, he thought they were a hoax at the time, and then he put them away. And then Elsie's mother, uh, Polly, she had a stronger belief in the supernatural and she was more convinced by the photos. And then in 1919, um, when the war finished, she attended a Theosophical Society and um, did a lecture on fairies. And at that uh, lecture was a guy called Edward Gardner, and he was part of the Theosophical Movement and he looked at these photographs and he was very intrigued. And he took them and he took them to a photography expert called Harold Snelling. And Snelling actually confirmed the photos as genuine. And he basically said you couldn't see any trace of any sort of studio work or painted figures, which is interesting. So because they thought that these photos were genuine they then brought it to the attention of this is where the story gets interesting the famous author of Sherlock Holmes uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and he himself was actually a keen spiritualist Um, he was writing for the Strand magazine at this time and this is where he published uh, his first uh, stories of Sherlock Holmes so he's you know he's very famous at that time and then in the Christmas edition of the, the Strand, he was commissioned to write an article on fairies. Um, and he actually asked for permission from Elsie's father if, um, if he could use the photographs. And um, Elsie's father said yes. But he, Elsie's father, to, to be fair to him, he, was, he wasn't sure if they were genuine. So because of this, he said, look, you, you, you can publish them, but... I don't really want to take any payment for it because I I kind of see it as a little bit of a fraud. But but before Conan published the pictures, he took a second opinion from Kodak uh, back in the 1920s. And um, again, they couldn't really provide any evidence to say whether they were fake or not. And they were a little bit on the fence at this time. Um, they, They couldn't... Like I say, they couldn't say whether they were or whether they weren't, but they weren't prepared to give a certificate of authentication. But what they did say was that they believed there was a little bit of evidence of faking. So when you think about it this time, these, these you know, at this time with this camera, it, very sort of amateur photographs, they, taking these to the specialist, they, it's incredibly good work from the girls if the specialist couldn't say whether it was fake or not. The other interesting thing here is that um, Elsie's father also found no evidence of any fairy cutouts or pictures or anything like that around the house or in the garden, which is interesting. Um, Mr. Garden then returned to the house and he gave a Kodak camera to the girls and said, go and take some more pictures of the fairy. So the girls did, and this is where you get the... 
the three other photos. So you get one of Elsie with um, a fairy offering a posy. Um, Francis in a profile profile shot with a fairy, and then you've got the fifth one, which is the fairies having a sunbath. The photos were given to uh, Conan Doyle, and he was so impressed with them that he released a book in 1922 called The Coming of the Fairies, um, which spoke about this case, and it's got all the photographs in it. And when it was released, it had mixed reviews, uh, critics... And the public were a little bit on the fence about the authenticity of, of the photos. And as time went on, uh, this story started to decline. And the two girls got married and they moved abroad. And it wasn't until 1966 that the um, Daily Express managed to find the one of the girls, which was Elsie. And they did an interview with her. And at this time, she she almost confessed about the story by saying that um, the fairies were, you know, might have been in my imagination, but she never really gave a full confession of a hoax at that time. And then it wasn't until 1983, uh, it was a time that they both confessed. They um, said in an article in an um, unexplained magazine that the photos had been faked. All except, now that's what they said, they said four of the photos had been faked, but the fifth one hadn't. So they they basically said it was a hoax, but they kind of left it, again, as I said, on the fence to sort of say, well, can't can't say about the fifth one. So they, they kind of left a little bit for you to think about out there and say, well, is it real or is it hoax? But what they did say was they did explain how they did it. They... Um, Elsie, she was artistic. She she painted the the fairies, cut them out cardboard, um, prodded them up with sticks, and very cleverly put them around her, and then obviously took the photographs. And as I said earlier in the in the episode, you know, for the girls when they were younger, when they were asked, you know, are they real or not? I suppose from a child's perspective, they're basically what they're trying to say to you is, yeah, they're real to me in my imagination. And I think the point to this case is, is that these photographs are a picture of a child's imagination, and you know the rights and wrongs of that. This this case drew out through throughout time, a little bit of time, people thinking that you know, are these real? Are they not? Um, again, it was World War One at the time. The, the world was in tatters for then these two girls to produce these photographs and there was just a little bit of a ray of light you know could these two girls have found fairies at the bottom of of the garden it was their interpretation same with i guess our interpretation of seeing fairies you know in disney and movies and the escapism so i think as i said earlier the point i'm making is it's is a picture of um escapism in this case the 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 thing that's real about it is it's it's funny what our minds can do and what we can see and stuff like that. So, it, you know, it's a bit of hocus pocus. Um, the photos are currently on display in the National Science and Media Museum in uh, Bradford. And unfortunately, the, the, the two girls, uh, Francis passed away in 1986 and Elsie passed away in 1988. And there's also a movie about this as well. It was made in 1997 called Fairy Tale: A True Story, which I, I really should have watched really before I did this uh, show, but I haven't seen it, but I'll, I'll probably go and check it out now. Um, so there you go, guys. I, I hope that kind of makes sense because um, it's a strange old case. It's, it, it, it's almost just as strange as the vampires. It's kind of... Um, when I was sitting down and making notes and trying to put this together on how I can tell this story, I I, I was really I was thinking how do I tell this story? How do I explain it? Um, because it's it's a it's a difficult one to try and try and pinpoint, pinpoint because there's so many avenues in in the case of the fairy and the fae and the fair folk as i mentioned there is so many avenues you can go down um so yeah it's it, it, if you have a little bit of time check it out have a look at have a look at the stories and the origins this is a very very interesting case and uh one that i will absolutely be bringing up again 
uh, with uh, future cases that I'll be looking into in the certainly in the mystery world. I guarantee I'll, I'll be mentioning the Fae and the Fair Folk, um, which let's face it, they're probably responsible for other cases, other mystery cases out there. Um, so there you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed that, Dan. Hope you enjoyed that as well, mate. Thanks for uh, requesting that as a as a listener request. It's uh, kind of blown my mind in a way. Um, but there you go, I'm going to wrap it up there, and uh, yeah, when you're out for a walk and you're in those mystical places, just look out for the fairies, guys. <laughs> um, but before I close the show, a little bit of um, admin, um, I am a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network, so please go and check out all the other shows on there, including uh, Bite Size Cinema Podcast, which is my movie review show. Uh, you can find... Um, the Mystery Vault podcast on iTunes, Spotify, uh, YouTube and several other players out there if you type in uh, the Mystery Vault podcast on Google. And I also have a Facebook page where I'm most active as well. Um, so yeah, put any, any comments, any suggestions on there. Um, you know, Let me know, I'll take a look at it for you. Um, so yeah, there you go. Um, keep it spooky, keep it safe and I will see you soon. here in this Enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network like Cinema Psyops, Cinema B, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse. Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.